Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage your host for the evening, Andrew Neal. Well, good evening. Welcome to Tuesday night at the London Palladium. <laughs> if only my mother could see me now, after all these nights of the Sunday. And, and you know, the stage still goes round. I checked that out, but we're not going to use that uh, tonight. Though I first got to know this place when uh, Bruce Forsyth was the compere. So I think it's only fair I should say, nice to see you, to see you nice. Now, thanks to Rathbones uh, for being our sponsors tonight. The Spectator magazine was founded in 1828. This is the biggest event in the Spectator's long history. There is clearly an appetite for politics. You are proof of that tonight. The motion before us, the subject for discussion is, should Britain leave the European Union? We want you to be part of this debate. You can tweet with the hashtag spec, spec Brit, that's spec Brit, and the handle is at spectator events. All of the chairs have voting slips for remain, for leave, or for undecided. Though we hope most of you will not be undecided, but choose one way or the other by the end of this debate tonight. We are in a generous mood tonight, so we are giving away to a lucky winner a year's free subscription to The Spectator. <laughs> and free entry to the next event. I mean, you'll be wanting the shirt off my back next. And also, we are giving a special cut price sub and a free Spectator mug. Not a daily politics one, I'm afraid, but definitely a spectator one. It makes the national lot lottery look absolutely parsimonious. So, let's get on with it. Let us welcome our debaters on tonight. For the Leave side, the leader of UKIP, Nigel Farage. The Remain side, the former Deputy Prime Minister, Lib Dem MP, Nick Clegg. <laughs> For the Leave side, the Conservative Member of the European Parliament, Daniel Hannan. For the Remain side, former Labour leadership contender, Labour MP, Liz Kendall. <laughs> For the Leave side, Labour MP, Kate Hoey. <laughs> and for the Remain side, Labour MP, Chuko Muna. So there we go, ladies and gentlemen. These are our debaters. The format tonight is that each will speak for five minutes. They're going to be quite tough on the timing just to ensure fairness. We will then have some interplay between the debaters, and then we have some questions chosen from the audience. They know who they are, and I will call them, and they will go to the nearest uh, microphone. So, without further ado, should Britain leave the EU, let me ask Liz Kendall to kick off the debate for the Remain side. Liz Kendall. Thank you very much, Andrew. It's uh, a great pleasure to be here tonight. By the strength of our common endeavour, we achieve more than we do alone, so as to create for each of us the means to realise our true potential. These words, written on Labour's membership card, are why I joined my party, and I believe they are as true for nation states as they are for all of us here today. The central argument made by those who want us to leave the EU is that Brexit will give Britain more control. I couldn't disagree more. In a world that's more connected than ever before, real control, the power to shape our destiny, rather than be left to the mercy of events, comes from working with our neighbours and allies to get the best for the British people. 
I think President Obama was absolutely right last week when he said nations who wield influence most effectively do it through the collective action that today's challenges demand. Being a member of the EU gives Britain more influence and power, not less. Not just the power to sell our goods to a market of 500 million people, according to rules that we help to decide, or to reach trade agreements as part of a stronger bloc of 28 countries, but the power to act together when the rule of international law is challenged on our own doorstep, like the sanctions regime imposed following Russian aggression in Ukraine, and the power to tackle global challenges like climate change, using our influence to secure a better deal within the EU and the EU's influence to get a better deal with the rest of the world. Now, cutting ourselves off from our neighbours and allies in Europe and attempting to go it alone would diminish Britain's power, not increase it. And it would give us less control to shape our future, not more. But whilst I care passionately about Britain's influence and role in the world, in the end, this referendum will come down to the central question of our economy and whether we'll be more prosperous in or out of the EU. There is not a single, serious, credible, independent organisation that thinks we'd be better off out. The CBI says Brexit would cause a serious shock to our economy. The World Bank, OECD, International Monetary Fund and IFS all agree our economy would take a hit. Yet some of those who back Brexit, like Aaron Banks, say even if there is an impact on our economy, it's a price worth paying. Well, I suppose at least he's being honest. But who will end up paying that price? Not Mr Banks. Not Dominic Cummings, who said there would definitely be problems for some areas of our economy. Or Boris Johnson, who's admitted there might be job losses. No. It will be those who always suffer in an economic downturn that end up paying the price of Brexit. Ordinary working people, the poor, the vulnerable and the low paid. Jobs lost, incomes hit and businesses and families left struggling to cope with the consequences. Slower growth and lower tax receipts, reducing funding for the public services we all rely on. And for what? A mere mirage of greater control. No wonder our friends and allies are speaking out, like America, Canada and Australia. That's what you do when you're worried that a friend's about to take a decision that could harm them and you. Britain is stronger in the EU, and the EU is stronger with Britain as one of its members. And who would cheer if we vote for Brexit? People like Vladimir Putin and Marine Le Pen. Nothing would please them more to see Britain and the EU weakened. I don't want us to play in their hands. I know whose side I am on, the side of our true friends and allies and the people I came into politics to serve. So whilst Frank Field might be worried about taking on UKIP, I am not. But I am under no illusions. I think we're in the fight of our lives. The decision we take on June the 23rd will define the future of our country our economy, the jobs and investment we attract, our safety and security and our influence in the world. Millions of people have yet to make up their minds on the biggest question facing our country in a generation, including Labour supporters. Almost they deserve... Minutes. Thank you, Andrew. They Don't deserve a strong and principled Labour campaign making a strong, proud and patriotic case for our membership of the EU. And that's what I, for one, am determined to do. Thank you. Liz Kendall. And now to open the debate for the Leave side of the argument, please welcome UK leader Nigel Farage. This is more fun. Well, thank you. Good evening, everybody. 40 years ago, we were inveigled into voting to stay part of a common market on the basis that it was all about trade and nothing to do with politics. And those of you over the age of 58 who voted for that common market undoubtedly feel that you were lied to. And 40 years on, we're fighting a referendum where the Remain side, or the Romanians, as I think they're now known,
but I'll, uh, I'll come on to immigration later. <laughs> the Remain side have clubbed together. They've got Goldman Sachs. They've got Siemens Engineering. They've got the International Monetary Fund. They've got Obama. They've got the political class, at least most of them, in Westminster, telling us that if we do not stay part of this political union, dreadful things will happen to us because we have this wonderful trade deal being part of the European Union. They are doing it, they are putting the leave camp on the back foot, and they're doing it to try and put us off the main arguments in this referendum. The fact is, ladies and gentlemen, we don't have a good deal with the European Union. For access to the single market, we pay a membership fee, we have the free movement of people, we have a massive regulatory burden, and we're prohibited and stopped from making our own trade friendships with the rest of the world. Do not believe them when they tell you tonight that the single market is good for Britain, that we need to be part of this club to access the single market. Every country in the world accesses the single market. And even in the worst case scenario, that Britain does not have a successful renegotiation and simply has to rely on WTO rules, even in that scenario, the cost of tariffs would be less than our net contribution. So don't listen to politicians who've never bought and sold a cargo or a product or a good in their lives. Business is done because consumers choose to buy products at the right price. Now, the real debate in this referendum is we have an opportunity, a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, to vote to take back the independence, self-governance and control of this country's laws, of this country's courts, and crucially, of this country's borders. And I'm urging you tonight to support this motion. I believe in democracy. I believe that if you get a government that makes bad laws, you should, after five years, be able to turf them out and replace them with somebody else who undoes the damage that they've done. When a European law is made, there is nothing that you, the voters, the House of Commons or the British government can do to reverse a single piece of European legislation. There is no direct democratic accountability within this European system. And frankly, I believe that those that went before us and sacrificed so much in two world wars did so so that we could be a free, independent, sovereign nation that governs itself. And part of that is we've lost control of our borders. Net migration into Britain is now running at 10 times the post-war average, and that's if you believe the official figures, which frankly, I don't. We have to build a new house in this country every seven minutes just to cope with current levels of immigration. We are short tens of thousands of primary school places for this September and the National Health Service is under literally intolerable pressure. What we need to do is take back control of our borders to say that our passport should not be available to 508 million people and let's put in place, post-Brexit, a sensible, proper, normal immigration policy along the style that the Australians do. Let's have people with skills and trades to bring. Let's have people who haven't got criminal records, which is novel for the Aussies, isn't it? <laughs> and let's... One minute. And let's have people who will add and contribute to the economy, but let's have them in sensible numbers. And in this age of terrorism, when you remember that two of the people that caused the massacre in Paris had come into Europe posing as migrants through the Greek islands, we'll be safer and better and more secure, taking back control of our borders, putting in place a proper immigration system, getting back the sovereignty of our parliament and our courts, re-embracing the parts of the world that we've turned our backs on, like the Commonwealth and elsewhere, whilst at the same time being friends and neighbours with all of those in Europe. This opportunity must not be passed up. Let's take back control of our lives. Let's believe in ourselves. Let's believe in Britain. Let's believe in a better, stronger future for our nation. Thank you.
Nigel Farage. Please welcome now our second speaker for the Remain side of the debate, Liberal Democratic MP, former Deputy Prime Minister, Nick Clegg. You're going to hear uh, or be subject to lots of claims and counterclaims, facts and counterfacts, uh, insults and counter insults uh, during the next hour or so this evening. But I would just invite you to hold three big thoughts uh, in, in mind as you uh, listen to the sort of toing and froing on this stage. And the first one is this that, of course, this referendum is a lot about what we all collectively and individually think about the European Union, whether we think the European Union is a good thing or a bad thing. But the more that this debate has continued over the last several weeks, the more I have the feeling that in many ways this debate is about who we are, who, what Great Britain is, what are we going to be as a country now and in the future? Are we gonna be an open country or a closed country? Are we gonna be a country that is engaged uh, with our near neighbours in the European Union or increasingly disengaged? Uh, are we going to be a United Kingdom at all? Uh, Nicola Sturgeon could not have been clearer just a few uh, days ago that if we were to vote as a country to leave the European Union, that would then trigger a second referendum in Scotland. So it's not just one union, our place in the European Union, which is at stake. It is also our own union, uh, the union of the United Kingdom, which is at stake as well. So, first, big thought. This isn't just about what you think about the EU and Brussels. It's also what we think about ourselves now and in the future. The second uh, sort of simple thought is the, the point that both Nigel and Liz, if from, from different points of view, I need us to say agree with Liz, Bob and Nigel, have already mentioned now, which is this word control. How do you, in a footloose, fancy-free, globalized world in which uh, criminals, uh, trade flows, uh, financial transactions, uh, pollution, don't, none of those things recognize borders, how do you, how do you reassert control? in that much more complex, fluid world that we now uh, inhabit. And my, I mean, Nigel's answer, he put it with great vigor, he's deeply misguided, but he said it nonetheless with great vigor, is we should put up the drawbridge. We should return to a sort of 19th century uh, vision of Britain, the, the age of sort of gunboat, gunboat diplomacy and all the rest of it. I don't think that is available to us anymore. I think the only way that we can control or maximize control over our own destiny, over our own economic fortunes, over safety on our streets, over the quality of the air we breathe, is by working hand in glove with our nearest neighbors in the European Union. We are safer, we are stronger. In many respects, we're bigger together than we are uh, apart. And the third and final thing is this. It's about the, the nature of this vote that we're gonna have on the 23rd of June, because it's quite quite different to any other kind of vote that we customarily uh, cast in our, in our lives. It's not like a, a general election, however important they seem, which sort of bind the hands of the, the, the next parliament for the, for the next five years or, or set expectations about what a government will do. This is a once in a generation vote. If we decide to close the door in the face of Europe, lock the, lock the door, throw the key away, we're not only, in my view, denying opportunities for us now, but most importantly, we're doing so for, we're closing off opportunities for future generations, for my kids, for your kids, for all of our, our grandchildren. And in many respects, that makes this vote so different to anything we've had to do before, because we mustn't just think about ourselves, we must also think about the duty we have to future generations, because they are the ones they are the ones who will have to live with the consequences of the decision taken by this generation more than anyone, anyone sitting in this theater uh, this evening. Now, it is my strongly held belief that to do the right thing for my own children, yet alone for the, for the country that I love, I believe, however flawed the European Union, and of course it is, that our children, our, the future generations of this country will be safer, will be better off, will be stronger by remaining in the European Union. Thank you very much. Nick Clegg. 
Please welcome now the second speaker tonight, speaking for leave. Please welcome the Labour MP, Kate Hoey. Thank you. <clears throat> Tony Benn called the EU a derogation of our historic democratic right to select and remove our governments. He was right then, he's right now. The Labour Party, as you know, was a, as a whole, when I joined, it was very sceptical towards the common market. And there are still some in Parliament today who were elected, including Jeremy Corbyn, on a manifesto of leaving the EU. I'm very proud to be following in the footsteps of great Labour figures whose democratic credentials can never be doubted. Hugh Gateskill, Peter Shaw, and people like Barbara Castle. The Labour movement's roots were to represent the interests of the workers against big business. The roots have shrunk then if they have, and they are, then so has the true meaning of left-wing politics, and we need to refresh them. Preserving the right to elect our governments who make the laws that we have to carry out is the basic minimum of people's rights. It's the basis of all other rights, and without it, rights can easily be taken away. And I don't believe you can trust people in power if they cannot be removed by elections. Now, no one can deny that the EU's government, the Commission, is unelected and cannot be removed by any of us or elections. And that fact alone is reason to me enough to reject the EU, regardless of all the other considerations that you will hear tonight. If we were looking now into joining the EU as it is, if we were looking now to join it as it is, the vast majority of people would be absolutely horrified at its anti-democratic status. And I've been in the Labour Party for many years, and occasionally uh, I've been known to disagree with my party's majority view. But I'm in the Labour Party because I care about our public services and the service that they provide to the most vulnerable. And the EU is going down a neoliberal path to open up those very services to global tax-dodging multinational corporations. Now, many people in my party think vaguely of the EU as some kind of social democracy. It isn't a socialist, it isn't democratic, it is exactly the opposite. It is corporist and anti-democratic. And the EU's founding principles, the four principles of capitalism, the four principles, the four pillars of the EU, free movement of goods, services, labor, and capital. And those are the principles of a free market. They are not the principles of a political system. And the EU's purpose is to rule in the interests of the smooth running of a corporatist economy without regard to the encumbrance of an electorate. Is this something that Labour voters or anyone else can support? Jose Barroso, president of the unelected commission, made it very clear in 2014 the EU is an antidote to democratic government. You know, how can he actually even try to pretend that he trusts the sense or decisions of the people? Another reason many Labour voices support the EU is that they believe it somehow favours workers' interests. The so-called social chapter was offered to the unions in exchange for acceptance of the anti-democratic nature of the EU, and they fell for it. It offered regulations about working hours and holidays, which could easily have been achieved by democratic means and served most to create an acceptable image for the capitalist EU. This is perhaps the cleverest fraud of all. It does nothing of the kind. It seeks to make out of the 450 million people, a vast sea of migrant labor, the biggest pull of migrant labor since the 1930s America, in America. Now migrant laborers are forced to work for a minimum wage and can be excluded from union rates by EU law, a good example being the Laval case in Sweden. The EU has even prosecuted unions for trying to get union rates for migrant workers. Why? Because they want to make cheap labor available right across Europe despite the hardship and upheaval it creates. At least when we oppose, and I oppose, the policies of this Conservative government, we can actually look to voting them out and reverse their policies. We can't do that with an unelected EU Commission. And similarly, on all the environmentalist issues, the EU, some people will say, is good for regulations of emissions, poisonous substances. Again, it's a, the, exactly the wrong impression. And this has been made very clear by the TTIP, trade agreement negotiated in secret by the EU. Not only does it give the go-ahead to US corporations to sue governments for loss of profits, threaten the enforced privatization of the NHS, and to impose GM foods despite British bans, and to make it impossible to regulate against harmful chemicals, it actually creates the legal conditions that undermine the very abilities of elected government to make laws in the interest of the people against the immense power of the multinationals. There could be no clearer indication 
clarification of what the EU really is, an attempt to replace the democratic power of the people with a permanent administration and interests of very big business. Everything else is a smokescreen. And minute. I cannot see, understand how anyone on the left who opposes TTIP would want to remain in the EU. And that's very clear why Obama was threatening us. People, people who know... People who know how dangerous the EU talk of reforming it from within. They know that that can never be reformed. The best way to secure our freedom and democracy in Europe is for the United Kingdom to leave the, EU, uh, to leave the EU. And finally, for people who keep saying, what does leave look like? Well, I'll tell you what it looks like. It looks like all the other 169 countries in the world with most of them with true democratic accountability, free trade, border controls, and so on. So the question is, what, what, let us be clear, there is no certainty about remaining in the EU. The price of true freedom is uncertainty. The price of certainty is a form of servitude, and we need to set our country free from that future servitude. Liz Hoey. Please welcome now our third speaker for Remain tonight, Labour MP Chukul Muna. Thank you very much, Andrew, and thank you to all of you for coming. What a fantastic audience. Look, the EU isn't perfect. Of course it needs reform. <laughs> But I don't think any of the three of us are arguing that. And actually, that isn't the question that we're being asked on the 23rd of June. We are being asked simply, do we believe we are safer, stronger, and better off in than out? And I'm very clear that we're better off in. Now look, Nigel and Kate have told you that we should get out because we've got no control over our own affairs. Now just think about that for the moment. In fact, Kate, Liz and I have spent the last six years campaigning as Labour MPs against things like the bedroom tax, the top-down reorganisation of the NHS, taking tax credits away from the working poor, you name it, there's a long list. Now, whatever you think about those things, they have all been implemented by a Tory-led domestic government. The EU had absolutely nothing to do with those things, or many of the things we see being talked about on our news every single day. Now, on the issues where we do work with our EU partners, it's simply not true that we get walked over, trampled over whenever we want to get things die, done. Why do we have people talking down Britain's influence in the EU and abroad in that way? Particularly when, if you look at the EU Council, nine out of 10 times, we're on the majority side. So why talk down our country in this way? And look, if it's control that you care about, you don't increase your control by giving up your power and your influence. Britain has always pulled sovereignty and worked with other nations. Does being a member of the UN mean that we don't have control over our destiny? Of course not. Does being a member of NATO, a leading member of NATO, mean that we don't control our own affairs? Of course not. And look, if you took the Leave campaigner's argument to its logical conclusion, the most sovereign nation in the world would probably be North Korea because they don't really work with anybody. <laughs> now, apparently, the three of us make this argument, as Nigel hinted at, because we're part of this kind of global elite which takes in Lem McCluskey, the head of Unite, working with those well-known socialists at the CBI, and of course not forgetting Christine Lagarde at the IMF, all of this being orchestrated by President Obama at the behest of Len McCluskey's new best mate, David Cameron. What complete and utter tosh. But look, most of all, I'm concerned, as Nick said, for what we bequeath to the future generations. By some margin on this stage, I think I'm the youngest person here. I was still at university when Thanks, Nigel, Jeff. Nick and Dan <laughs> joined the European <laughs> Parliament. But the point is, the idea of us working and networking with others in this interconnected world, it makes so much sense for the young and future generations because that is what they're used to. That's what they've grown up in. We're not at war with these guys anymore, Nigel. This isn't the 1940s or the 1950s. This is 2016. And they are going to have to live with this decision for far longer than any of us 
on this stage. Now, we live in a big and complex world, and I think you can either adopt a small Britain, a small vision of Britain in this very different world, where we sit on the sidelines, we're not at the top table, we fail to live up to our great history of punching above our weight in the world, or, or we can bequeath to the next generation a big vision of our country, proud of our history, proud of what we've achieved in the past, but ambitious and self-confident for what Britain can achieve in the future, not only for people at home, but in terms of building that fairer, more secure, better world abroad that we want to see. So I say, let's go big. Let's make Britain even greater than it is already and reject the small vision for our country that you see offered by the people who want us to pull out of the European Union. Let's stand tall. That is what this EU referendum is about. Very good. And our third speaker tonight for the Leave side of the proposition, please welcome Conservative Member of the European Parliament, Daniel Hannan. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm inviting you to make me redundant. And indeed, in the bargain, make Nigel redundant. And I wouldn't be doing that if I were not confident that there will be plenty of openings for newly unemployed MEPs in the boom that will come to this country after we've left the European Union. And I'll tell you why I am so confident about that prediction. If I put it in one word, it would be obsolete. We just heard from Chucker that these are not the 1950s. He said it as though he was imparting an original insight. Absolutely, these are not the 1950s. And that's why we have outgrown a top-down dirigiste construct, a hangover of an age when freight costs were high and refrigeration was expensive and regional trade blocks looked like the future. But my friends, that world has been made completely redundant by technological advance. This is an age of the internet, of cheap flights, of Skype. It's as easy to do business with a company in New Zealand as with a company in France. In fact, easier, because the Kiwi company will be English-speaking and common law. Never before has geographical proximity been as irrelevant as now. So why? Why do we tie ourselves to the one part of the world that is not experiencing significant economic growth? Over the last 10 years, China's economy has doubled in size, India's economy has doubled in size, Ethiopia's economy has doubled in size, but the Eurozone, incredibly, was the same size at the end of last year as it had been in 2006. Every continent on this planet has grown over the past decade, except Antarctica and Europe. <laughs> now, we are a trading people. We're a maritime people, a people connected by language and law, by habit and history, by commerce and migration to every continent and archipelago. We don't sit on great natural resources here. We have to make our way in the world by what we buy and sell. That means we have to be where the customers are. And as long as we're in the European Union, we cannot sign independent trade agreements with non-EU countries. The EU deal with Australia is being held up because some Italian tomato growers are currently challenging it. The EU deal with Canada is being held up because of an unrelated dispute about Romanian visas. How have we put ourselves in a position where we can't do those deals? Liz cited a few of the big international quangos and the Davos men who tell us that it's in our interest to stay. She said there's nothing in it for the little guy. Well, let me cite a couple of people who are leaders of the Remain campaign. Paddy Ashdown says, if we leave, it'll mean cheaper food. And Lord Rose says, if we leave, it'll mean higher wages. Now, I would have thought that if Liz is really interested in the interests of the working people that she says she's speaking for, she would give more weight to those opinions than to those of the tax-free Michelin-starred international quango crowds who she sees as the arbiters of our national interest. Why are we paying to belong to the world's only stagnant customs union? Paying 19 billion pounds gross, 11 billion pounds net every year, right? To put this in context, in the last, we just heard about the cuts and, you know, the, the Labour MPs were standing against all these coalition uh, reductions. In the last parliament, the 2010 to 2015 parliament, 
According to the IFS, the entire austerity program saved 36 billion pounds. Over that lifetime of that same parliament, our gross contribution to the EU was 85 billion pounds, our net contribution was 42 billion pounds. So even if you insist on taking the net figure, that one clean excision would have wiped out the whole of the austerity program and still given us enough left over to take a penny off income tax. But it's not just the financial price. It's the democratic price. We fought a civil war in this country to establish the principle that laws should not be passed nor taxes raised except by our own elected representatives. And now supreme legislative and executive power is held not just by people that you didn't vote for, but people that, actually, but people who generally owe their position to having just lost elections, like Peter Mandelson and Neil Kinnock and now Jack Sutton, only when they've been expressly rejected by their electorates that they are invited to come and legislate for us anyway. Now, look, if the EU were about cooperating, if it were like NATO and all the things that Chuck was saying, no one would have a problem with it, right? You'd have to be insane to be against the idea of working with neighboring countries. Can we take it as read that all of us on this platform, all of you in this room, are in favor of cooperating with our immediate neighbors and allies? The problem is that it presumes to legislate for us, that it wants to take on the attributes and trappings of statehood. No one is talking. I mean, Nick trotted out all the cliches about drawbridges and throwing away keys. No one is talking about isolation. Nowhere else in the world do countries apologize for wanting to live under their own laws. You know, New Zealand is not about to join Australia. And we don't go around saying, oh, these dreadful Australo skeptics, when are they going to understand that they're a small offshore island clinging to outdated notions of sovereignty, right? Japan is not applying to join China, as far as I'm aware. And people don't say, oh, these bigoted Sino skeptics, when are they going to get it through their heads that they've lost their empire? It is a natural, healthy thing for a democracy to live under its own laws while trading and cooperating with every other country in the world. We are the fifth largest economy on the planet. We're the fourth military power. We're one of five members of the UN Security Council. How much bigger do we have to be before we have the confidence to raise our eyes to more distant horizons and rediscover that global vocation which we once took for granted? Daniel Hannan. Now, in a minute, I'm going to go and get some questions from the audience. But before I do, just let me ask a couple of my own. Uh, Nigel Farage, Nick Clegg says you just want to pull up the drawbridge. Why? No, Nick. I don't want to put up the drawbridge. I want to control who's coming over the drawbridge. That's what we get by being an independent nation. Nick Clegg? What's the question? He, he's, well, he says he hasn't got a drawbridge, no, no, but no. if he did, he would control no, no. people who I went want, across want, it. We, we want controlled no, migration, no, no. Andrew. We want controlled migration into no, the United I get, Kingdom, I get, I get the not point. open door. Why, why, in that case, if being in the European Union is the genesis of all the anxiety about immigration, why is it then, per head of population, Australia and Canada have twice higher rates of immigration than we do? They're not members of the European Union. The United States has a net increase of a million people every year. They're not a member of the European Union. There is this absurd assumption in what Nigel Farage and others say that those desperate, desperate refugees fleeing from conflict and destitution in Syria will somehow stop trying to come here the moment we're not members of the European Union. They are fleeing persecution and violence. They just want to be safe. We've got to have a slightly more adult conversation about immigration. Immigra people moving large distances in large numbers happens in every continent around the world. It is not something created in Brussels by the European Union, and it is profoundly misleading to claim otherwise. Nigel Farage, quick reply. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, Nick, but, but the British passport is now held by 508 million people, any of whom can come to this country. And I would say, the reason that Australia and Canada, pro rata, can take more migrants than we can is they've got rather more space and rather more room than we have. But net migration from outside the EU is higher 
the net migration from inside the EU. Yeah, and that's bad British government, and I agree with that, and I'm not saying that for all of our faults have come from the EU. There's a lot need sorting out at Westminster too. But the fact is, we have an open door, and we're members of a European Union whose stated aim is to bring in new countries, like Bosnia, like Albania, and crucially, Mrs. Merkel, and she's the real boss these days, and Mrs. Merkel wants Turkey to be a member by 2025. So we're part of a union that is letting in poorer and poorer countries who ultimately will have unrivaled free access to our nation. And I think the point has come, frankly, where enough is enough. Uh, Muna, what do you say to Dan Hannan's point that by being in the EU, we've shackled ourselves to what is now the slowest growing part of the OECD, of the advanced uh, economies? Well, they're our biggest customer. We export 44% of our goods over to the EU, and that helps create jobs here. I should just say, I mean, look, on this point of immigration, I, I, I'm a son of an immigrant, and I think... And now that you come back, come back to that, I, and I will, but just on the economic point, which is what my uh, question was about, mm. uh, About 12 years ago, we exported 55% of goods and services to the EU. It's now 44% and falling. That may be because demand has fallen because mm. it is so slow growing. So but, uh, why, why, my question was, why would we shackle ourselves to an economy that has been stagnant now for almost a decade? But I don't believe that we are shackled because of course it's not just the trade that we have with our biggest customer in the single market we also have access to the various different trade agreements that the European Union has with non-EU countries. And I don't buy this proposition that either we go after our EU custom or we pursue opportunities, say, in the Commonwealth. My family are in the Commonwealth. We actually need to do both. Look, if you're running a business, you don't just ignore your existing client base to go after new ones. You seek to do both at the same time. So it's not an either-or scenario. It's not about being shackled to the European Union and or pursuing um, other opportunities elsewhere. We need to do both, and that's fundamental when we have such a big trade deficit. Except that the EU has done free trade deals with other countries that amount to $7 trillion uh, dollars of global GDP. Switzerland's done free trade deals with other countries that amounts to $40 trillion dollars of global GDP. Are we not missing out? No, I don't think we are. Well, and say. if <laughs> we, I don't, I don't believe, I don't believe we. What, I don't, seven versus forty. I, I don't believe we are missing out. Well, that would be to dismiss. Let me just give you uh, an example. I was speaking to the head of Fujitsu in the UK today. They employ twenty thousand people in this country, and they've had three. They've invested three point nine billion pounds in the UK. So more than Nissan and Toyota put together. Now, when they made that investment decision three to four years ago, they could either come and make that investment at Fujitsu here in the UK, or they could go to Italy, Germany, or France. And in the end, they chose to make that investment here in part, and very important part, because we are part of the European Union. So you can laugh at the figures, but that is the reality in terms of jobs. And I've well, just given you one company there, and I could give you many others, because in the end, it's about people's livelihoods, this. Let me put that point to Dan Hannan. It isn't just our trade with the EU, which is still substantial at 44%. There are many companies in this country because we are a member of the European Union, and I'll give you two examples. Uh, they're both Swiss. Credit Suisse and UBS are in this country because financial services is not part of their agreement with the EU, Switzerland's agreement, so the big Swiss banks have come to London because they're inside the EU. Well, by the fact that they're here, you demonstrate that you don't have to be a member of the EU to be trading with the EU. No, right? but they're here because oh, we're in the you, EU. Yeah, if you narrowly look at financial services, the EU, the other 27 members of the EU, take 33% of our financial services export. The US, when nobody pretends that there's any kind of single market, on its own, takes 31%, right? And this is because we are a global trading country. And I know which of those I think is gonna be the longer, the better long-term prospect. Chucker said something which was true and important. He said it shouldn't be an either or choice. 
we shouldn't have to choose between trading in the EU and trading with the rest of the world. I absolutely agree, and that's why I'm urging people to vote no. There is a free trade area, there is a tariff-free zone that stretches across the continent from non-EU Iceland to non-EU Turkey. There are no tariffs in that area. The only geographically European state that is not part of that free trade area is Belarus. So no one is seriously suggesting in Brussels that if Britain left the political structures of the EU, we'd be excluding ourselves from that free trade area. But we would be gaining the capacity to sign bilateral deals, as Switzerland does, with China, with India, with the bits of the world that are, in fact, growing. Right, I'm going to go to the audience and to Henry Madel, if you could uh, get to a, a microphone, but I promised Chuka I would come back on the immigration point you wanted to make. Well, uh, actually, I was just going to come back on the point that Daniel's just made. Look, on the, on the immigration point, our country has many problems. Uh, we don't have enough homes. Uh, we need to invest in our public services, which have been drained at the moment. But I think we do a great disservice to the immigration debate if we simply seek to blame all of this on immigration. It's domestic governments of different political persuasions who in the end haven't done what needs to be done. And the other side of the coin is, of course, we've got two million Brits who are benefiting from free movement and live in the EU. We've got EU citizens who've set up businesses here which employ 1.5 million people. And our NHS, which is of course the big story today, there are over 100,000 EU nationals helping our NHS function. So let's have a more mature and balanced debate about okay. immigration in this country. Let's which go, actually, I let's think, go to the audience. does a disservice to us. Thank you, Chukumuna. Henry Madel. Good evening. Um, I have recently graduated and I'm now training to be a lawyer. I have 36 thousand pounds of student debt. Why should I vote to leave the European Union when to do so would surely increase economic uncertainty? Kate Hoey. Well, as I said, uh, I don't actually think that leaving the EU is creating anything other than a certainty that we will be able to make our own decisions and, and do work in, in the way that we want to as, as an elected government and as an elected opposition. In terms of student fees, um, we, you know, that is not directly affected by, I, I accept, by the EU. No, but no, but what he's asking is he's got a lot of debt around his neck right now. Oh, he, yeah. He's training to be a lawyer, so actually he'll probably get rid of that debt quite quickly. <laughs> um, but anyway. I have to pay the fees. Uh, what he wants to know is, why, given that he's got that debt round his neck, why would he vote for economic uncertainty? Because there has to be, surely, if we leave, a degree of uncertainty. Um, there's a degree of uncertainty in the, probably the initial phases, and there's no doubt about it. The, the CBI report came out and said that initially there would be some uncertainty and there would be some, some perhaps slowness, but ultimately, we would be better off out. And I do think that, you know, your individual case is, is you know, is, is, ups, is upsetting for you, but I see absolutely no reason why we, well, of course it's upsetting for everybody who's got debt, uh, and I'm one of those people who was educated because there was absolutely no fee to pay, and I voted against the increase of, and putting any, any uh, fees at all on student grants, because I think actually what we did as a Labour government was try to send far too many people to university and ignore okay. all those people who would, anyway, that's getting away from oh, yeah, the point, it, Andrew. It certainly yeah, is, so I'm going is. to stop you now. But it, it's uh, Liz Kendall, no, no, you got away from the point. You don't get a second <laughs> chance. Liz Kendall, well, you, you, it's fair to say that there's also uncertainty if we stay in, isn't there? I mean, the Eurozone is still stagnant. Uh, there are serious political problems in many of these Eurozone countries, not just econo e economic problems. There's a major migrant crisis unfolding for the second year. There's uncertainty whether we leave or stay. Of course there is. The world is an uncertain place. But in answer to the question, you shouldn't vote for greater risk in the economy. I mean, one of the problems I think that the Leave campaign has is they've still not been able to describe the kind of deal that they'd want to negotiate. You know, are we going to be Norway? Are we going to be Switzerland? Are we going to be Canada? Or the latest, Albania? Um, and we don't know what the impact will be on prices, on tariffs, on growth, on investment, on job creation. And as I said, 
most serious, credible, independent organisations, and I would say, Kate, uh, you know, uh, trade unions representing four million working people believe that our economy will be hit, will be worse off, and it'll be people on low pay and with debts who will suffer the most. That's always what happens in an economic downturn, so right. don't uh, So why don't did the chair of risk? your, your organisation actually say that, um, he, th that wages would rise? Stuart Rose, who, uh, who's been heading your campaign, though we've not heard much of him lately. Um, <laughs> uh, if he's watching Alan or listening, um, we'd be campaign. delighted to Can hear from him. He on said on that if we left, wages would probably rise because they'd be less cheap labour. And he didn't think that was a good thing. Well, you know... Oh, the counter side, the counterbalance to that, as I said, is the CBI, the IMF, the World Bank, yeah, but he's the leading IFS, your campaign. But all, well, but he will no doubt Liz, uh, Liz. have his opinions on that, but I think most people think that there will be a risk, and I just don't think it's but worth Liz, it. Liz, nearly all those people, and some of them on this, on this platform as well, said that we would be so much worse off if we didn't join the Euro, including Nick. Exactly. Well, uh, I, I've never said that in my life, so uh, I'm not going to take responsibility uh, You've never been in favour of the Euro, uh, Liz Kendall? No. Uh, Nick Clegg, you wrote in Prospect magazine in 2002 that if we remain outside the Euro, we will simply continue to subside into a position of relative poverty and inefficiency <laughs> compared to our more prosperous European neighbours. Would you... Um, would you like to delete that now? Yes. <laughs> yes, I would. Can I just... Uh, and I'm going to talk to Henry. It's where, too where, late, I've got no, the cash. No, can, I, can I talk to... <laughs> Henry, where are you? Uh, yeah, so I don't think I'm probably the best placed person to talk about tuition fees. Um, so I won't, I, won't, I won't address that point. Just to point out, though, that if you don't earn, you won't have to pay back. Anyway, never mind. Um, now, the point I want to talk to you about, Henry, is because you said, you know, about your future. You're qualifying to be a lawyer, right? OK. You might, I assume, I don't know, you might want to uh, enjoy the opportunity to uh, travel and work around uh, the European Union as a lawyer, as a newly qualified lawyer. Now, here's the thing. Under the single market, and this is what the outlot always deliberately obscure, they talk about old-fashioned trade, as if it's all about tariffs. Those are the taxes you put on physical goods. Actually, modern trade is all about the rules, including, for instance, qualifications for lawyers that impede the free movement of people and the establishment of businesses and so on. If your law firm wants to practice law in Denmark or Spain or Finland or wherever across the European Union, under the present single market arrangements, by the way, an invention of a British uh, then European Commissioner, Lord, Co Lord Cofield, established by Margaret Thatcher's government in the Single European Act, the biggest pooling of sovereignty, Dan, by any British government in the post-war period. What they did, in my view, rightly and intelligently, was recognise that modern trade is not this old-fashioned stuff about tariffs. It's about the laws, the, the technical standards, the, 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 the qualifications... Okay, the, the, the non-tariff non non -tariff barriers. No, no, I need to get I'm, another question. If, no, no, it's very important, this. If, he, if we pull out of the European Union, Henry will not be able to uh, work as a lawyer elsewhere in the European Union. And if we then, as a country, decide to conform <laughs> to those rules... <laughs> If we conform okay. to those rules, we'll do what Norway and Iceland do does. We'll not be at the table where those rules are made, and we'll still be subject All to right. them. In other words, a no, catastrophic no, no, loss of sovereignty. OK. I, how many of you... No, 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 Dan, I'm London, sorry. The We've Union. got a lot of questions to go through, and it, uh, this event is for the people out there as much as for the people up here. Ed Potter, next question from you. Um, thank you. Um, the debate has been heavy on the economics of leave and remain. Isn't a more important reason to remain in the EU its role as a guarantor of peace in Western Europe and, its, and as a promoter of democracy in Southern and Eastern Europe? A guarantor of peace in Western Europe, a promoter of democracy in Southern and Eastern Europe. Dan Hannan. Ask yourself one question, Ed. Does it make more sense to see the EU as a cause of post-war peace in Europe? Or doesn't it make more sense to see it as a consequence of a peace that was based on the defeat of fascism, the spread of democracy, and to some extent, the NATO alliance? It's necessarily difficult to answer counterfactuals, but look at the effect 
that excessive integration is having on relations among European countries now. The Euro and the Schengen zone are the two great pillars of integration. Uh, the current president of the Commission, with that peculiar imperviousness to events that defines his cast, still says that they are the two greatest successes of the European, now, would you, uh, the European Union. Now, would you say that they are making countries get on better or less well? Look at how German newspapers write about Greece. Look at how Greek newspapers write about Germany. Are they soothing or stoking national antagonisms? Here's the, the, the question that I would put to people who think that the EU is the guarantor of peace in Europe. Look at the other parts of the world where democracy and trade have spread and where without needing supranational structures, they've solved the problem of interstate war. There's been no major conflict in North America since 1865, but they're not in the European Union. Setting aside tiny border skirmishes, there's been no interstate war in South America since 1941. They're not in the European Union. Switzerland has not known internal conflict since 1848 or interstate war since 1815, and it's not in the European Union. So the idea that we owe our peace any more than we owe our democracy or our prosperity to Jean-Claude Juncker, I think is an insult to the people who have actually policed the peace on this continent, and those are the people in British and American Bravo. uniforms. Bravo. Well, look, the has the EU made a contribution to peace and democracy? It has, but let me just say something about North America. Look, the, the reason there hasn't been a war in North America, I presume, is because they've pulled sovereignty and the different United States work together in one united union of states. <laughs> but look, this point on uh, the EU's contribution to peace on the continent and in our region. I think people often forget that in the 70 odd years before the EU came into being, France and Germany uh, went to war no less than three times and a lot of blood was spilled as a result. Now, I wouldn't say that since then, and of course it would be absolutely unthinkable for that to happen now, I wouldn't say that since then the only reason that we've had peace in Europe has been because of the European Union. NATO, of course, has played a role, but my gosh, it has made a tremendous contribution to ensuring that we don't have that kind of situation happening again, because we work together to solve common challenges. And I think one of the biggest things that worries me about politics in advanced economies is that, look, Globalization has brought a huge amount of uncertainty. People feel incredibly insecure. There are lots of opportunities, but it's also quite frightening, the change, too. Now, of course, there's a natural human instinct in that sense and in that context to look at who do we blame for all this uncertainty and insecurity. And juxtaposed against that is a desire to actually work with others to tackle the big challenges that we face. Now, I'd much rather we adopt the latter position than the kind of former, if I call it, Donald Trump view of the world, where we just seek to blame everybody for our problems instead of working together with others who share our values to meet these big common challenges that we have. All right, Isn't there a fundamental ahead. point about democracy? Quick, quickly, Nigel Farage. I, I mean, the question to was, next. We, we try to credit the European Union with spreading democracy. Well, the Euro European Union is very good at encouraging the growth of democracy in countries until they join the European Union. And then it's very good at trying to take away democracy from them. I explained to you earlier that the people who have the sole right to propose legislation and the reform of legislation within the European system are the unelected European Commission. And when they propose the law, and it's gone through the machine, there is nothing the voters or national parliaments or national governments can do to change a single piece of legislation. It is not just undemocratic, the system is fundamentally anti-democratic, and it's got so bad that during the Eurozone crisis, we even saw the Premier of Greece and the Premier of Italy removed virtually by a coup d'etat from the European Commission and replaced with former Goldman Sachs employees. The European Union is the death of democracy. For that reason, if nothing else, we should leave it and get back to being a self-governing democratic All nation. right, thank you. Next question from Alan Gibbs. Thank you. Many of the arguments over the past months, and we've heard some more of them tonight, that have come from the Remain camp have been framed in negative terms. 
Can uh, we now hear the single most positive reason that Remain Camp believes exists for us staying within the Union? The single most positive reason for staying in, Liz Kendall. Because if we complete the single market to cover services, I think we're going to see you know, more opportunities for jobs and growth in future. I think you know, building a stronger economy is still the biggest challenge we've got in this country, and a completed single market, I think, will be great for Britain. Secondly, climate change. I thought, actually, well, you just I wanted made quite one. a positive... Just the single most positive reason. I know, jobs is it, but can I say, just to sort of slightly disagree with the questioner, I believe that making a positive case for tackling climate change is a really important part of our membership can, of the EU. Can I just... On the, on, the point of, hold on, on the point on jobs, which you yeah. gave us the single most positive reason. Why are you so confident of that when uh, the continental Europe is awash with mass youth unemployment? I would actually, Andrew, like to see uh, many countries in Europe do far more to boost jobs and growth and tackle unemployment. That's why I believe in reform within the EU. But without doubt, if we complete that single market in services, many organisations believe we'll see more opportunities for our companies, and I want to see that happen. Nick Clegg, the single most positive reason. Safety in numbers, I think. <laughs> OK. I really, I mean, uh, by the way, can I just say on this jobs point, if the European Union was the reason for unemployment, why on earth do we have some of the lowest unemployment in Europe after 40 years of membership? It's a ludicrous assertion to somehow say that... And this, actually, have you been fact, to Greece? Hold on, hold on, hold on. Sorry. The, the fact that we have much lower un unemployment in this country compared to other European Union economies shows that we can have access to what is the world's largest borderless marketplace and yet still govern our own rules as far as labour laws are concerned. We have a much more flexible labour market. We have the best of both worlds. It would be madness for the opportunities which we should be securing and offering to future generations to throw that all away. For what? For a future, is it Norway, is it Switzerland, is it Albania, is it Canada? You can't even tell us what no, future Britain. you it's want Britain. to provide for us All in right. the future. And, and, and Nick, you can't tell us what happens if we stay in. No, I could, staying in is I, not Dan, the same as staying in. I cannot, I'll come back. I cannot, on no, no, a conveyor Dan, belt. I, no, I, hold I, on, Nick Clegg, I'm come back to you, Dan Hannan. a really critical point to understand that the European Union is changing. And it's changing rapidly because it's dealing with these twin crises, the Schengen crisis, and the euro crisis and it's responding to both of them in the way that it responds to everything else with more integration now britain has other options because we kept the pound because we didn't join schengen we have an alternative we can reorient away from a declining enervated eurozone towards the rest of the world. But you need to understand that there are risks both ways. You don't know what unemployment is going to be if we stay. You don't know how many more bailouts we're going to be dragged into, how much more integration, how much okay. more migration. Yeah. Either way, there are risks, but we must be safer if we can mitigate those risks ourselves yeah. by taking back control of our own right. democracy. Well, Nick Clegg. Well, of, of course, of course, of course, no one's going to be foolish enough, I hope, on either side of the debate to pretend they can tell the future. Of course, the, the, the United, United Kingdom will develop in ways we can't fully predict. The European Union, you're quite right, has some problems which it needs to deal with, which will develop in ways we can't fully predict. But two things. Firstly, as you have just pointed out yourself, we can create a status for ourselves in the European Union which secures the best of both worlds. We have access to the single market. We're not part of the Eurozone. We're not part of Schengen. We've secured a whole range of other options, uh, uh, opt-outs which means that the European Union is not the straight jacket on our identity which you seek to imply. It's a much, much more flexible arrangement than that. The one thing I can tell you about the future is this. I cannot think of a single major challenge which our kids and our grandkids will face which doesn't require a supranational, mm. international response. I, you cannot deal with climate change. You cannot deal with cross-border crime. You cannot deal with terrorism. You cannot deal with globalization. You cannot deal with international trade. You cannot deal with the uh, unsettling effects of financial markets without acting together. Every acting one of together those is, is global, not a symbol not European. of weakness. Every single it is one a of sign those is a global, strength. not a European yeah. issue. Yeah. All right. Let's go to our next Sorry. question. Stuart Wheeler. Given that duties for non-EU countries average only about 1.3%, why is access to the single market so important? Chukomuna. 
Sorry, could you... Uh, oh, well, I, I'll repeat it, sorry. Repeat Given that the average duties, using WTO figures for non-EU countries, the average only about 1.3%, that's on goods, not, not on services, but yeah. on goods. Um, why is, given that these tariffs are so low under WTO rules, why is access to the single market so important? Uh, well, you made the point in a way. And was the question from, what was the name of the questioner? Stuart Wheeler. Ah. Oh. Um, <laughs> actually, well, since I can't see him, I'm not sure if it's the same Stuart Wheeler you. Actually, from the voice, I think it is. Anyway, what's, <laughs> re regardless of the voice, what's the answer? I, I can see him, it is. Um, <laughs> The point is, though, under those WTO rules, we're not talking about services, and services make up 80% of the UK economy. And can I just say something on this particular point? Because we're being asked to believe, look, we are a great country, as I said in my opening remarks, we're the fifth largest economy in the world, yes. Uh, and it is asserted that we will be able to get a trade deal with the EU if we were to leave pretty much on the same terms as we have at the moment. Now just think about that for a moment. That is asking you to believe that our European partners would give us a deal that they don't even have themselves. So they would give us access to the single market without us having to be paying a fee to be part of it. Presumably there's a presumption also that we'll be able to have some say in the rules. Of course they're not going to do that. And that is the question, that is why Remain campaigners, people making the case for us to stay and keep coming back to this point, what does out look like? I don't say that there's no uncertainty ahead. Of course there is in either option. But at least you have more certainty and you know what you have now, whereas you don't know what you're going to get if we leave. Okay, thank you. Nigel Farage, just, just looking at some of the things you've been saying recently, uh, am I right in thinking that you don't really, you don't care anymore if we're part of the single market? Well, the question was very interesting. This single market, Stuart, is a fable. Services. Liz talked about completing the single market in services. It's been going since 1986, and still we're no nearer to British insurance companies being able to freely sell their products in Germany. The point Maybe about access. To do your job better, the point about access to the single market <laughs> is we keep. Well, but the point is, it, 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 in, in services, financial services, it's got us nowhere, and we keep hearing the Remain side say, Ah. To access the single market, we have to pay a membership fee. Oh, no, we don't. To access the single market, we have to have the free movement of people. Oh, no, we don't. Stuart, the answer to your question is, every country in the world has access to the single market. No, the single market is nothing to do with politicians. It's consumers. Business in the world isn't done by politicians. It's done by consumers who choose to buy our products if they like the price, and trust the, rel the reliability. Andrew, I'd rather we had a sensible free trade Andrew. deal with what is now the biggest export market for the Eurozone in the world. But even if that went wrong, as Stuart implies in his question, the cost of tariffs, even in the worst case scenario, would be less than our current level of contribution. And while I'm at it, I keep hearing Norway. I keep being told by everybody from the power I've not heard there. Norway. Has anyone from, mentioned well, Norway? Well, it's very odd. It's Who's very mentioned odd. Norway? But, Stand but up. Everybody yeah. keeps saying, wouldn't it be dreadful if we were like Norway? Wouldn't it be awful? Can you imagine being rich, <laughs> free, and able to catch your own fish? Norway doesn't sound too awful to me. Um, Andrew, Andrew, do you know what? Do you know what? Do you know? Do you know what the Norwegians, this supremely sovereign, free nation of, of fish eaters, do you, know what, do you know what they call their membership of the uh, European Economic Area? They call it fax democracy. What and do you know why? Do you know why? They call it fax democracy because they have to abide by the rules. They have to abide by the rules. They have to abide by the rules of the single market to have access to it, and they have no say over the rules whatsoever. They are written by other countries. They're faxed to Oslo. They have to. Where is the control and sovereignty in that? What does the latest opinion poll in Norway say? In fact, what have opinion polls over the last 15 years consistently said about whether they should join the EU? 79% of Norwegians prefer this imperfect deal with their fax machines and to, to what we labor. have, which is having to apply 100%. You are making of the case. Dan, you are making the case, not on opinion polls. You're making the case that they have greater control. They have a catastrophic of have loss of control. control, which is why the of Norwegian Prime control. Minister said, not "Please the don't follow our, our, our example." Can we deal with some facts on Norway? Can we please deal with some facts on Norway?
can we get this right? Because for the, for the whole of the Remain campaign, you, Nick, the Prime Minister and others have kept coming out with this complete untruth that Norway has to abide by all the rules and has no say. Between 2000 and 2015, the Norwegians, who incidentally export 80% of their overseas goods to European Union countries, Norway abided by 9% of European Union legislation. They have the absolute right of veto over any EU legislation. And frankly, if we want to sell goods to America, we have to, come, we have to apply by their rules without having a say in Congress. Stop lying about I Norway. I Norway he, is doing Norway. very, very well right. right. indeed. Andrew, I think... We're going, no, we've got a lot more questions to get through. I'm still trying to work out why the Norwegians are so rich they're still using fax machines, but that's a, <laughs> that's a different issue. I think the reason... Matthew Piggott, oh. please. Matthew Piggott. Good evening. Chaka, I'm afraid you won't recognise me. I can't see you. you? Just get on with the question. <laughs> <laughs> History shows us that turmoil in Europe means turmoil in the UK. Is it safe to leave Europe to the Europeans? What? Kate Hoey. Sorry, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question. Can you repeat it? Well, I'll read it, it again. History yeah. shows us that turmoil in Europe leads to either turmoil in the UK or turmoil we end up having to get involved in. So is it wise to leave Europe to the Europeans? Well, we're part of Europe, even if we leave the EU, and that's another myth that the BSE lot put round. Um, I, 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 by the way, can I just say, because I really think it's important on that last question, you didn't call me and I didn't shout loud enough. Norway, the, the reality is... No, no, Norway, please go. No, no, I'm serious. <laughs> So we, we've wanted, done that. I know, uh, look, I'm, we've got more questions to get right. through. If you keep going back to the previous one, we'll never get on. Well, it's Please just, stick to the question. Well, you I, never, I you cannot, for, no, just to explain to everybody, with six people debating here, I cannot okay. let everybody reply to every question. My job is to make sure I'm fair to both sides in replying, not to you as individuals. So okay. I've asked you to answer Matthew Piggott's question. Which I've now forgotten. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Sorry. But well, I'm if, not sure if, I'm going to remind well, you. I, I, <laughs> I, would, I would say on, on the turmoil in Europe, and yes, I'm afraid this goes back to a previous question as well, because I didn't get in on it either. And that is, that is when we look at where the most people died in, the, in Europe in the last 20, 30 years, the EU could not do anything to sort out the terrible situation in Bosnia and Srebrenica, and we needed the United States to come in and help. So the idea that somehow the EU keeps us safer and keeps Europe safer is, is, is a nonsense. So I'm not sure whether that asks, answers the last question right. or not as well. Let me uh, go to the next question because it's related to the one we've just had uh, from Antonia Filmer. Antonia, your question, please. Uh, tensions with Russia are growing. If things come to a crisis point, would we be safer in or out of the EU? If the Russian bear is rumbling, are we better in or out of the EU? Dan Hannan. I think it makes no difference as long as we're in NATO, and there's a case for being in or out of NATO, but that's the military alliance. Whether or not we're in the EU, I think, makes no difference. Although I did hear Jean-Claude Juncker the other day saying, we need a European army, not in order to use it, he said, but in order to scare Vladimir Putin. <laughs> now, I mean, I don't claim to be any kind of expert in the psychology of the Russian autocrat, but I doubt that he stays awake at night <laughs> fretting at the prospect of Jean-Claude Juncker saying to NATO, guys, don't worry, we'll take this one from here. So I, I would feel safer retaining the Western alliance that has served us very well. And I'll just say that I think that, that our departure may be a moment for democratic renewal for the whole of the European Union. They have swatted aside every other no vote in every other referendum, but a large member country saying this is it. We're not going to have this remote self-serving clique handing down its rules to democratic national right. parliaments anymore might just lead to other countries having a better deal to put in the place of the current EU, one that respects the sovereignty and right. democracy. So the question was about Russia, and you mentioned NATO. 
Do you think the future of NATO would be in safe in Donald Trump's hands? No, I wouldn't be a supporter of Donald Trump in any circumstances. So, given that he is the lead Republican contender at the moment, we cannot, can we, always depend on America to run NATO, pick up the bills, provide the troops and the material? We we can't 70 always, of course, does. when you use a word like always, necessarily, because the future is, as all of us have agreed, necessarily unpredictable. But we are surely better off as a sovereign country making alliances with our friends and allies on every continent as they come together, bound by common values and common interests, than handing over control of our foreign policy or our defense to the institutions in Brussels that gave us the CAP and the common fisheries policy. Liz Kendall. Uh, does our security, uh, and I don't mean in this case against terrorism, I mean against geopolitical developments like the, the rise of a more aggressive Russia under Mr. Putin, does, uh, are, does the EU help us or is it fundamentally NATO that we depend on for that? I think the EU does help us. I mean, we did manage to agree sanctions against Russia after their aggression in the Ukraine. And as I said in my opening comments, you know, Vladimir Putin will cheer if we, you know, vote for Brexit. I don't want Britain or other EU countries being distracted by protracted renegotiations of all our deals. We have to focus on the big challenges we've got. Yes, the migration crisis, but also issues like the rise in Russian aggression. NATO is vital, but we don't have to choose between the two. And it is a serious concern uh, that weakening the EU will play into Putin's hands. And I don't want to see that happen. Nigel Farage, well, is it not a concern that all of our allies, all of our allies, most famously recently our most important ally, the United States, want us to stay, but the one country that probably doesn't is Russia? I think what's a concern is that the European Union has been very deliberately and openly provocative towards Russia. The, oh. the idea... <laughs> The idea, and Mr. Cameron, in fact, has been in the vanguard of this, very much so. I mean, ever since, ever since David Cameron became Conservative Party leader, one of his big ambitions is that the European Union should extend to include the Ukraine. Uh, now, we're moving down the track towards that. Already, we've got a visa access free deal with the Ukraine being negotiated. The Dutch voted against it in a referendum the other week, though I suspect they'll probably just be ignored. Um, and the point about Putin is leave Ukraine as a buffer state. I don't like the way he operates. I would never want to live in his country, but let's not be openly provocative on Putin. Nobody and I worry, and I worry, and I worry, a okay. part of but, another but I worry country. that we're part of a European Union, which if we remain within it, now intends to have a strong foreign policy and is hell bent on creating its own European army. Now I said this, in 2014, and old Cleggers over here said <laughs> that it was a dangerous fantasy to suggest there'd ever be a European army. Nick, they're building it. Increasingly, this is a militarized European Union, and the I don't so. like the, the look of it. Course. I prefer NATO, where sovereign states cooperate together. Nick Clegg, are we um, building a European army? No. No, no, Nigel is willfully confused. He's talking about the border force that quite rightly is being put in no, place to try and, no. to try and monitor the... But can well, I, just say, no, can I, can I just say, we've heard, no. something, quite, we've heard something quite <laughs> extraordinary this evening. We've heard Re Nigel Farage the say that we, or Brussels or somebody, has provoked Putin. Yes. He marched into Ukraine and annexed Crimea. Brussels didn't Our do that. The European didn't do that. And the only way, the only reason, the only reason why his aggression, his continued aggression, in what is now a frozen conflict in eastern Ukraine. The only reason he's showing any restraint whatsoever is because Russian exporters, the Russian economy, is massively dependent on the economic superpower at its neighbours, which is uh, at, at its borders, which is the European Union, and that economic superpower has imposed meaningful sanctions. That is a absolutely crystal clear example of clout that we would never have never have on our own in the face of what I consider to be immoral, illegal and unacceptable aggression and I think it's outrageous that he tries to well, excuse it. Well, all right. Andrew, Andrew. We will Andrew. move on.
Andrew, can I just had a say on that? Let me uh, get a question out from Pips Taylor. Pips Taylor. Speak to me, Pips. Hi. If we vote to leave the EU, could it lead to the breakdown of the United Kingdom? Will it lead to the breakup, I think, of the United That's Kingdom? That's what I meant, yeah, break up. Uh, don't worry. Thanks for that. Cheers. It's my humble job to Staying in, make sure you say what you want. Wait till I get to you. Just relax. <laughs> um, Kate Hoy, will it not lead to the breakup of the United Kingdom? No, uh, if we're talking about the Scottish dimension, um, the Scottish Nationalist Party want to have a referendum at the slightest opportunity. So I don't think whether we leave or stay will have anything to do with that. And I also think it's important to point out, because there is this kind of myth around that the whole of the Scottish National Party, the whole of Scotland, is somehow desperate to stay in the EU. I think we'll see on June the 23rd just how wrong that is, because the Scottish uh, groups are just as split as many of uh, um, you know, the rest of the United Kingdom. I really genuinely don't think it will make, make a difference. And I also, also think the idea that somehow they would vote uh, to leave and then want to have to rejoin if they were independent and to take the uh, euro, which they'd have to do under the EU rules. So I don't think that's true. And as far as Ireland, Northern Ireland's concerned, um, you know, I'm from Northern Ireland and uh, very, very strongly people in Northern Ireland still, despite everything that's happened by a huge majority, want to stay part of the United Kingdom. They want to trade with the, with the Republic of Ireland. They want to be friends. It won't make the slightest bit of difference. And it's another bit of a sort of kind of, let's raise something else to scare people. Don't be fooled. Shukur uh, Munaf, is the thought? union safe even if we vote to leave the European Union? I think if we vote to leave the European Union, I think Scottish in independence will very much be on the cards. But can I just ask Kate, because she said something very interesting, though, uh, uh, about Scotland. So is it safe? Can is, you, the EU, is it safe? Are you answering the question? Is it safe? I, I did. I just said that. I think, I think that the, the UK could split up if we leave the U European Union. But the question I was just going to ask you... Sorry, so you don't think it's safe? Yeah, he thinks it'll break, break up. Ah. Yes, I answer your so question. What, what's the but, question? Well, my question was, Kate said something quite interesting, if I heard her correctly, which is that actually there is a mix of views, and amongst uh, Scottish MPs and others, uh, there are different views on the European Union and whether we should stay in or we should come out. Kate, can you name a SNP MP who wants us to leave the European Union? Well, I... I I have been told, well, Jim Sillers is leading a very he's, he's substantial... Not an SMP no, he's not, a, MP. he's not an MP in Parliament. Would, would he stop worrying? Well, he has Look, to put an I, MP, if, so if don't I, name someone who's not an MP. Well, Jim Sillers is leading an anti-EU uh, anti group in the Scottish Nationalist Party. Th this obsession with MPs, thank goodness there's only, whatever, 658 of us with a vote. There are millions of people with a vote, and the idea that just because MPs in a party the are all is, united, that somehow the, the, that the is... SMP, this, the this SMP referendum, not, then, then this not, referendum not split will this be issue. about people out there actually deciding that the politicians aren't always right. But, well, that's uh, true. I wouldn't disagree with that. Just uh, for the record, Kate Hoy, did I understand you to say that you think that... Uh, Scotland is going to vote to leave? No, no. What I said was that the way the media, blame the media, well, the way the political parties, the little elite of all the established parties that are all saying we've got to remain, they're implying that somehow Scotland is so different from the rest of the United Kingdom in terms of its But you don't its think attitude. it'll vote to leave? I'd, I would hope that uh, I'd hope that the majority no, of the whole hope. of the what United asking, Kingdom will vote to leave, but I don't think the difference in majority, whatever it is, will be that different in Scotland from England or Northern okay. Ireland or Wales. Let's, uh, for the record, we'll see on the night. Uh, next question from Robert Wheel. Robert, um, it's David Chubb. Uh, I'm I'm uh, asking a question on behalf of Robert Wheel. Who well, it better get... be the same one. Yeah. <laughs> He couldn't get here because of the rail strike. Ah, I understand. <laughs> Thank you. And the question is? If we vote to remain, how will we control immigration from the EU? If we vote to remain, how will we control immigration from the EU? Liz Kendall. Well, I, for one, am actually pleased with uh, the part of the renegotiation the Prime Minister has achieved by saying people who come to work in this country, uh, who come to this country should work and contribute uh, before they're able to claim benefits. Uh, that's something I strongly argued for during the Labour leadership campaign. Um, but I believe that 
You know, immigration in this country has brought massive challenges, without a doubt, and I would be the first to say that. I've seen it in my own constituency. But I also personally think we need to stand up for the contribution that migrants make in this country, setting up businesses, working for our NHS, the fact that they put far more into the system than claim out. You know, I want clear rules. Rob, excuse me, he didn't ask Sorry. if immigration was good or bad, which is the question you're answering. What he asked was, if we stay in the EU, how will we control immigration? What's the answer? Well, I was saying the rules that I believe need to apply, which is if you come here, you should come to work and not claim benefits. You should abide by the rules and values of this country, but that we also need to speak up for the positive benefits that immigration has brought to this country. That may not be a popular cause amongst many, but I've seen it in my own constituency, in businesses and the but NHS, and we should make that case but far are you more say, loudly are, are and Are you clearly. saying that people should only be able to come here if they've got a job, that they couldn't just come from the EU? as job seekers. Well, my understanding is that, you know, since 1995, at least three quarters of people who come here from the EU have, ha you know, uh, work, uh, which has often been a higher proportion than British born. But do they need to country. have a job? Do they need to have a job? If, if you shut up, I'll ask the question. <laughs> uh, no, because that's uh, part uh, of... Are you saying that you should have to have a job? No, I'm you not. Can, you're because not that's part that. of, you know, free movement and labour. You can live, work, study in other countries. And we also have to... So how would you control who comes here from the EU? Because can you do it? Uh, I do believe that we need to have, uh, make sure that we have stronger border controls. That's something that we have campaigned on for a long time. Hold on, hold on. I believe that we need strong border controls and those clear rules, and I think that it's, you know, what the Prime Minister has negotiated would help, but I also want to make the positive case for the benefits that Fine. immigration brings. Is it, uh, Nigel Farage, desirable that we should clamp major controls on immigration from the rest of the EU? Because given that our economy has been performing pretty well and much of Europe hasn't, we have managed to attract some of the best and the brightest of Europe to come and work in our country. Why would you want to stop that? Because when you have an open door, when you have an open door, you will attract some of the best and the brightest, but you will also attract a number of people that you'd rather hadn't come in the first place. We're not even able to stop foreign criminals from Europe coming into our country, and we should be able to do so. David, the question, you know, if we vote to remain, what will we be able to do con to control immigration? The answer is we won't be able to control immigration if we stay in the European Union. And these lies, I mean, Cameron spent 10 million quid of your money putting a leaflet through your door telling you that if you vote to remain, we will retain border controls. All we do is ask people to flash a passport. We are completely, effectively borderless. Half a billion people can freely come here. And let me predict, that with the EU enlarging, including Turkey, and given that the Eurozone is headed back into serious crisis and Greece will need to be bailed out again at some point in the course of this year, the numbers of people fleeing poverty in Europe can only increase, and we need to be tough about this. We need to make sure that we take Andrew, the brightest and the best, but we've got to do so in limited numbers. This is the number one issue in British politics. Every single poll, says immigration, security, jobs are at the top of people's agenda in Britain and the only way of dealing with this is to vote to leave the European Union and uh, take back control of our borders. Can I um, just clarify uh, one point? I understand that if we leave the EU, we'd have more control over who comes to work here from the EU. I, yes. I take that point. But would we have any more control over EU citizens who are coming to visit us. I mean, do you envisage that to control that, you would introduce visas for EU citizens? No, I don't think we should need to do that at all. I don't see any need for us to have to have visas, but I do see the absolute need for people, if they want to get jobs, to register so we know who they are, how long they're going to be here for, and that we don't even consider paying benefits or entitlements to anybody and so they've legally been in the country, worked for five years, paid taxes into the system, and obeyed the law. Nick and that Clegg. is plain common sense, frankly. Nick Clegg. And that's what the population wants. I think, I think, I think David, the, uh, the, 
the, the blunt sort of truth is, and I, whilst I strongly disagreed with what Theresa May said, was it yesterday, about uh, coming out of the uh, Human Rights Convention, um, I agreed with the way she characterized this. She basically said, look, could fully controlling immigration, if that's your objective, is actually pretty difficult whether you're inside the European Union or not. As I said earlier, you've got good examples of major economies, Australia, Canada, you know, the United States, which per head of population have much higher, and before Nigel says it because they're big countries, small countries like Liechtenstein, Switzerland, Norway have much higher immigration per capita than we do, even though they're not part of the European Union. And in fact, in some respects, it might be more difficult. The French could not have been clearer. They said if we pull out of the European Union, the border controls we presently have on French soil would be moved to, to Kent. So I think, I think I think to try and have a kind of a, a, a sort of accurate uh, debate on this, we have to kind of admit there is no scenario in or out of the European Union where you can completely seal your borders, or hermetically seal your borders, and nor is there in other parts of the world either, in the modern world in which we but do, now But the question uh, was, just to bring you back to the question, it was if we vote to remain, how will we control immigration from the EU? I mean, isn't the honest answer is that we can't and we don't? The, the honest answer is people, just like many, many Brits, many, many Brits retire, live, study, work abroad in the European Union, people who exercise the right to work in this country can come and seek to do so. There are plenty of uh, checks and controls which we can reject people, as we have against thousands of people, if we think they will do our country harm. But yes, you're absolutely right that the principle that we can all, as many, many Brits do, it is a two-way street, uh, uh, seek to work in other parts of the European Union remains. My point simply was, don't believe the kind of suggestion, because there is just no evidence in any other country, not least in some of the uh, countries, Norway, etc., which are lauded as a great example. There is no example of a country which has somehow managed to sort of build, well, Donald Trump wants to build a wall, uh, against the Mexicans. That's a good example. They're having a very similar debate. I don't think his wall is going to work if he ever builds it in the same way that I don't think pulling well, out the, the Hungarians have already is built a wall. simply make the immigration issue evaporate. The, the Hungarians have already built a wall. They're in the EU. The Austrians have closed the Bremner Pass. And Montenegro, which is planning to become a member of the EU, has built a massive fence. Yeah. And they're not going to work. They're not going to work. In the long run, in the long run, in my oh. view, the only... And by the way, this is why it's a good thing that we remained out of the Schengen arrangement. The Schengen arrangement, as you'll know, is this mm -hmm. ability to move around the Schengen countries within the European Union without showing your passport. The reason why it's good we're out of that is because Schengen... The, the fundamental flaw of Schengen was that they removed internal borders without imposing external border checks, which, which is what they're now doing right. through this new border force. That's what they need to sort out. All these fences going up across Europe are absolutely not the way forward. I want to get a final question from Grant Evert, if we can get the mic to him. But before I do, Dan Han and I said you, I'd You know you why we are not falling for these ghost stories from the Remain campaign is because in the middle of all the fear and doubt, you suddenly get some utterly risible, implausible claims, such as we just had, that the Calais jungle will move to Kent. Right? Now, the idea that we would have migrant camps in Kent any more than we have them at Gatwick or Heathrow or any other point of entry is utterly absurd. All three speakers actually answered that question in, this, in very different ways, but they all gave the same answer. If we stay in the EU, we cannot control net inward migration into this country. And the key word there is control. I think Nigel and I slightly differ in our view about immigration. I'm quite in favor of having a measure of legal primary immigration into this country, and I'm in favor of having a refugee element as well, probably a bit more than Nigel is. But if I'm going to make that argument, people need to know in exchange that we are in charge roughly of who comes in, and we are in charge roughly of what numbers. And as long as we're in the EU, we have no such sense. And apart from the craziness of taking unqualified EU migrants, overqualified migrants from elsewhere, I think there is a basic immorality, a basic unfairness with the way that we are treating old friends and allies who stood by us in the two wars when we were most in need. I have constituents from Commonwealth backgrounds and all of the MPs here will have the same story. People who now may have, uh, may have families who fought for us in one or other of the war who can't now bring auntie over for a wedding. I mean, not, not to settle here, right? Just to visit because we've so cracked down on the non-EU part 
of our migration policy in order to free up but, unlimited space for people who may have zero still, connection to this country. There are still more migrants coming to this country from non-EU countries than from yeah, EU but, countries. But a lot less but than there were. But you just said they couldn't get in. Well, yeah, and... and, and the anti can come. I'll tell you, uh, uh, Andrew, if She's you were... To get and to if you wedding. did constituency surgeries, and I think Chucker and Nick will be honest enough to tell you that they've had the same thing, almost and everyone please. is having... And Liz, I'm sorry. Almost everyone is having this problem. I have a constituent now who has been married to a right. woman for 12 years in St. Lucia, right? This is not some sham marriage. He cannot now come into this country because right. there is a practical limit to how many people you can bring in, and we've had to open our doors to everyone But you accept we still EU. bring more in from the non-EU than from the EU. Yes, That's the figure. But I want us to be able to decide who comes in on the basis of merit, no, I understand all that. connections I understand to this country, and Chuka, the English language. Final word for you on this. Well, I'll tell you what my constituents say about this, and the interesting thing about the immigration debate, actually, is that many of those who raise concerns with me around immigration the most are my black and Asian constituents. And all they, in the end, tell me they want, they want people to pay into the system before they take, take out, they want proper enforcement of our labor market regulations, they want people to be helped to learn English if they come here and to integrate. But the reason, in the end, they don't go for this kind of dog whistle stuff on immigration is because in the end, all the things that people are saying about Eastern Europeans now are very, very similar to what people were saying about my father when he came here in the mid-1960s and Asian people, and they don't want any truck with that. Okay, thank you for that. And one final very quick question before we go to the, to the vote. We're overrunning a little bit, but I think you'll understand why given the quality of the debate. Grant Evert. Uh, thank you. Thank you for leaving the, uh, the best to last. Um, <laughs> I'll be the judge of that. Um, on, on June 23rd, can we also vote to leave the Eurovision Song Contest? Yeah. <laughs> no. No. Yes or no will do, Nigel Farage. I think the whole thing has been rigged against us right from the start. It's a conspiracy. <laughs> and the sooner we're out, the better. Kate Hoey. Yes, absolutely. I would like to uh, get out of it as well. I think it's <laughs> not worth watching anymore. Dan Hannan. Let's have another referendum. I'm always and everywhere in favor of referendum. <laughs> Liz Kendall. No, 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 I love it. Definitely not. I, I love the Eurovision. Come on, it's great. Why is Israel allowed to be in the Eurovision? Yeah, so I'm going to... I don't know and I don't care. Very well, let's not go there. Nick Clegg. I miss Terry Wogan. I think it's a brilliant show, uh, and we're yeah. safer and stronger and better in the Eurovision Song Contest. <laughs> <laughs> Chuck Amuna. It's not. Well, well. <laughs> it's not really Chuck's music. Yeah. It's music, It's harmless, isn't it? At the end of the day, and sometimes this is a very serious debate, what's the harm in having a laugh? And the Eurovision is a laugh, isn't it? Very well. Now, we come to the moment of the debate, you should, of the vote. You um, will have all should have uh, three different things. You can only hold them up. It's remain, leave, or undecided. Let me ask, first of all, can we put up the house lights a little bit so I can see? I'm going to ask Dan and Liz to help me adjudicate on, on, on this. All right, and we can see you up there too. Yep. Can I ask, first of all, who is still undecided? Ooh. <coughs> oh, well. Wow. A good view is the answer. Who wants to vote to leave? <coughs> and who wants to vote to remain? Well, the leaves have it. The leaves have it. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank Andrew, you. If you were a Eurocrat, you'd make them vote again until they got the right result. Well, we may have another debate and they can vote again, Dan. Let me first of all thank you all for coming tonight and participating, being such a wonderful audience ev everywhere. A great debate, there's still a lot undecided, so there's all to play for on both sides. Thanks to Rathbones for uh, sponsoring tonight. On the way out, you'll see all sorts of little spectator things you can buy, maybe even get free. One of them I highly recommend is this little pocket. You stick on, back of, on the back of your phone and you can stick your credit cards in it. It's perfect and you brand the spectator too and it means you can lose your phone and your credit cards at the same time. <laughs>
Before you go, ladies and gentlemen, a huge round of applause for our wonderful debaters. Thank you and good night and travel safely. Good night. Enjoy that.